All right, here we are for part two of lecture 16 of CENG 4412 Steel and Concrete Design. So we're going to continue from the theory of, uh, of columns, of ideal. And so uh, what I would like to do next is we have in the previous video, we looked at deriving the equation for oil collar and buckling, but we did this in terms of a p-value. We, we derived it in terms of a p-value. What I would really like to have instead is something some, more of a stress versus a stress type approach. And so um, what I want to do is I want to create a plot of stress versus slenderness. So uh, for columns, what we want to instead look at is uh, stress versus, uh, instead of looking at, uh, in I should say in reality, uh, Euler column buckling will not control for all cases. Uh, will not control for all cases. And the reason for this is that beyond a certain length, or below a certain length, uh, Euler buckling controls for larger lengths. Uh, Euler buckling controls uh, controls for uh, a below a certain length, or sorry, above a certain length, for above a certain length, a uh, certain length, but below that length, uh, but below that length, but below this length, regular uh, yielding, uh, regular material yielding, just uh, like just like tension members, etc. But below this, uh, this length, regular yielding controls. Uh, regular yielding controls. All right, so regular yielding will control. Okay, so uh, here, and uh, let's consider this. So um, below the certain length, regular yielding will control. In other words, just regular crushing of the column, essentially. And so what I want to do is I want to create a plot illustrating how all this stuff kind of connects together. And uh, if you can, I would also like us to open up our steel manual, because we're going to be working with steel first before we look at concrete. Uh, because steel is, uh, we, we, because when we add concrete columns, we need to add in some more complexities dealing with beam columns and things like that. But uh, we're going to be in chapter E, and I need to find equation E2-2 uh, e and E3-3. Uh, let's see here. Oh, sorry, E3-2 and E3-3. Okay. And we'll be referencing that. So what I want to do is I want to create a plot of slenderness. So let's look at stress versus slenderness. And I'm going to sort of, what the code does is instead of looking at a p-value, an allowable p-value or something, it's based on more of a stress type approach. Well, it's based on sort of more of a stress-based approach. So let's create a plot of stress versus slenderness. Stress versus slenderness. And I want to create a general plot here. Here. And let's consider this. And let's say On this axis, I'm going to plot the KL over R. Um, I'm going to plot KL over R, the slenderness. And you, remember, you may remember that term from mechanics and materials or from uh, structural analysis. KL over R is often referred to as a slenderness, and we'll talk about K in a bit. Uh, that is the uh, support condition, but the effective length factor, basically. And then I'm going to put on this axis the critical stress, FCR. Basically, the critical stress for a, a, a column of that particular slenderness. And so you can actually see FCR referenced in equation three, E3-1. Uh, basically, this is the, the critical stress that will cause a column to fail, depending on what its slenderness is. OK. So first of all, I, wanna, I want to draw the idealized uh, curves. 
Now, if you look at this here, uh, if I go back to the Euler column buckling equation, you'll notice something fairly interesting here. Um, as the length, okay, think about this, the Euler column buckling equation. Uh, think back to calculus. Uh, it's, it's, if all of these things are constant, n, pi, e, and i, what is the limit of that function as l goes to zero? What is the limit of that function as l goes to zero? What do you think? Infinity, yes. So the Euler column buckling equation tells you that if you have a length of zero, oh, your column can support infinite pounds of load. Obviously, that's not the case. Uh, things obviously don't actually have infinite capacity, but Euler column buckling uh, says that, uh, you know, if you have a, uh, for example, if you have a column 0.1 inches tall, it will tell, it will happily tell you that it can support an absolutely ridiculous load that would send that thing, that would cause your column to crumble into dust. So uh, obviously, um, that would cause even the strongest steel you could ever have to crumble into dust. Uh, so Euler column buckling is only going to control over a certain length. And so uh, what I want to do is I want to kind of draw out the idealized equations and then the uh, then kind of the uh, the code approach equations. So here, first I'm going to show the Euler equation. Euler equation would be something like this. It would happily go off to infinity. It wouldn't even appear. We wouldn't be able to see the end of the uh, end of it on this chart because it's going to asymptotically approach uh, infinity, basically. We'd have this kind of asymptotic equation here, and this would be uh, Euler. This would and this equation would be F uh, Euler, uh, capital F for stress again. F Euler would be something like pi squared e, uh, pi squared e divided by uh, KL over R squared. KL over R squared. But then below some critical length, below some critical length, we would switch from uh, we would switch from Euler buck uh, buckling to just regular column yielding, where this stress would just be equal to the yield stress. And really, you're never going to get beyond this. This is your yield stress. This is yielding. And so and I, in uh, ignoring any kind of factors of safety or load factors or resistance factors, if we were taking things, if we were ignoring any kind of LRFE philosophy, we would design our column kind of like this. And this is what you do in mechanics and materials. You just say, OK, well, we have two failure modes. We have the yielding state and we have the buckling state. And past a certain transition region, uh, past a certain transition region, we're going to be concerned purely with yielding. And then, uh, or before a certain transition region, we're going to be concerned with yielding. Uh, but then uh, before that, we're going to be concerned with, uh, before that, we're going to be concerned with, um, or we're going to have, effectively, uh, we're going to have uh, just, uh, how should I say, before that, we're just, bef before that region, we're going to have uh, uh, yielding, we're going to consider yielding our design limit, and past that, we're going to consider, uh, we are going to consider uh, Euler buckling our design limit. Okay, but anyway. Uh, of course, the actual code doesn't uh, allow us to go right up to the limits of the material. We have to add some sort of, we have to add, add some sort of, uh, we have to have some sort of, uh, how should we say, uh, you know, resistance factors in there. So let me come down and provide a dividing range here. And the dividing range, this is going to be based off of uh, we need to figure out that th there is a critical dividing stress that will divide the two regions that we're in. And this is going to be uh, where KL over R, where KL over R is equal to 4.71 uh, times the square root of E over FY. E over FY. Uh, 4.71 times the square root of E over FY. And you can actually see that uh, in the uh, uh, in the chapter E uh, below below equation chapter below equation three one, when it tells you which regime to use for e, uh, for uh, calculating your critical stress. If you're greater, if KL over R is less than four point seven one e over F Y, you're using one thing. If it's greater than four point seven one e over F Y, you're using a different thing. Okay, so that's going to be fine. But then we also need to look at, say, okay, well, um, our code is not going to allow us to use the full yield stress. And so we have two uh, modified forms here. And so here, 
we have to, re we're not allowed to go fully up to the yield stress. We need to add some sort of resistance factor. So the code is going to allow us to only go up to something a little bit less than that. And then we have another equation here that will be a, a reduced form of the yield of the buckling stress. So this here is going to be equation, uh, this here, sort of the code equations, this is going to be equation E3-2. E uh, E3 and the equation for this is going to be that FCR, the critical stress, FCR is equal to uh, 0.658. 0.658 times Fy, or to the Fy, uh, divided by Fe, where Fe is the Euler stress, divided by Fe, uh, uh, to the Fe there, and uh, times Fy, times the yield stress. So basically, to get our F critical, we first need, we need both the yield stress and the Euler stress. So you're, go you're always going to need to calculate that. And then this, and then this reduced equation here. So we're, it's kind of, it's based off of the uh, euler buckle equation, but we reduce it a bit to take into account uh, uh, load uh, factors, basically, or sorry, resistance factors. And this would be equation E3-3. E3-3 and E3-3 effectively says. Well, we just make a we just use a reduced form of the Euler equation. E three dash three. We just have E, uh, sorry, FCR. The critical stress is equal to zero point eight seven seven point eight seven seven times the Euler stress. Point eight seven seven times Fe. And uh, in terms of this, uh, some other final terminology to to be aware of, we have uh, two regions of this curve that we that we call, we, that we label things. We refer because we defer, because we derive the equation of buckling uh, using elastic theory. We refer to this as elastic buckling, while um, we ha if we have just regular yielding, we can refer to this as inelastic buckling. So elastic and inelastic. So this is kind of an interesting case where we're used to el the elastic region of a curve being toward the left end for say a stress strain diagram, but in this case, uh, the inelastic will actually be on the left side and the elastic will be on the right side. Okay, and that's the basic uh, code approach to handling this, but uh, we'll continue on and look at this. So what does this mean? What does elastic versus inelastic mean in this context? Uh, what does this mean? What does it all mean? What does this all mean? Well, so let me compare this inelastic versus elastic buckling. Inelastic buckling. And why do these labels work for each of them? And elastic buckling. Here. Uh, here, so basically, if we've taken everything up to the yield stress, uh, some part of the, of the some part of the cross section, uh, some parts of the cross section have yielded uh, yield prior to buckling, and that's why it's referred to. And it still will buckle, but it, some parts of it will yield prior to buckling. Uh, so some parts of cross section yield prior to buckling. Bucking, no buckling. Uh, prior to buckling, and typically, typically where this is going to where this is going to control is this is going to be critical for short stubby columns. Short stubby columns. Uh, and then elastic buckling. This is where the member this is where the member buckles prior to any yielding. To any yielding. 
So in other words, the entire cross-section is still well under the elastic limit before uh, buckling actually occurs, uh, before any yielding. And so where this controls is, well, this is going to be for long, slender columns. Long, slender columns. Uh, next, I'd like to show how we actually derive the Euler stress uh, calculation, uh, Euler load versus Euler stress. I've already showed it to you, but I'd like to uh, sort of show how this is calculated. So let's go from Euler load to Euler stress. Euler load to Euler stress. Euler load to Euler stress. So we start with our, pre, uh, our P critical. We know that P critical is equal to P elastic, or sorry, P Euler. P Euler or pi squared E, pi squared EI over L squared. I'm ignoring the N. I'm just assuming we're talking about the first uh, buckling mode uh, where N is equal to 1. That's the critical one uh, in almost all cases. Uh, then. Uh, I know that stress, if I want to transform this into stress, I can say that stress, uh, Fe, well, this is going to be equal to Pe. If I know stress is just force over area. So this is Pe divided by A or pi squared Ei, uh, pi squared Ei over uh, L squared A, over L squared A. However, I also know that we have a term. Uh, I also know that I can use, I, I, I also know something that combines both I and A. There is one term that we have from a, a section property that combines both I and A. What is that? Some term, some, uh, what is the section property that combines both I and A? I and A, I and A. What is that? It starts with an R. Radius of gyration, yes, thank you, you got it right away. Yes, very good. Radius of gyration. Uh, so R is equal to the square root of I over A. I is equal to the square root of I over A. And interestingly enough on this, it's actually going to be the minimum uh, R. This is the, When you load up a column, it's not going to, you know, preferentially buckle in the, in the, in the strong axis direction. It's, it's just going to take, you can't load up a column in buckling like you can a a beam or something like that. In a beam, you can purposely load it in the strong axis, but with, with columns, it's just going to buckle in whatever direction is the weakest. So uh, anyway, uh, so if I then look at this, I can then say, okay, well, this stress then, if I replace I over A, well, what can I, how can I explain this? I could say that this is equal to uh, pi squared E over L squared over L squared uh, times this I over A, if I separate this out, I over A, and also therefore R squared has to be equal just I over A. This has to be equal to just uh, I over A. Or oh, I could say that this is equal to pi squared E over L squared times R squared. Or I could then also say that this is equal to pi squared uh, E divided by L over R quantity squared, L over R quantity squared. And, uh, and that basically is our equation, except we're going to add one other thing, and that is the K factor, the effective length factor, which I'll discuss next. Uh, so uh, we'll add one other thing. And we'll get the final value of pi squared E divided by, uh, let's say, KL over R. KL over R quantity squared. KL over R quantity squared. Again, making sure you're using appropriate units here. Where K is the effective length factor, and I'll discuss this on the next slide. And often we refer to this whole thing combined, uh, KL over R, as just the sort of the column stiffness. As column stiffness. 
This really represents the combined effects of all of the column's geometry. It combines the length, the support conditions, and the, the cross-section. This is column stiff. We sometimes refer to this as column stiffness. Okay. So uh, next, I'd like to look at uh, the effective length factor. And I want to find the page number for this. I'll actually, I'll, I'll leave that up there while I, find, while I hunt down the page number here. The number I have in my notes, I believe, is for the uh, an old edition of the manual. But let's see if I can find that in the commentary. Huh? Uh, well, it's chapter E, obviously, yes, but where in chapter E? 35? Okay. Uh, is, is there that table? There's a certain table I'm looking for. Uh, no, that's not the table I'm looking for. It's it's in the commentary. It, let's see, 16.1. It was 511 in the old edition, but let's see if we can find it here. Um, let me see if I can find this, the effective length factor table. It's CA-7.1, I know that. At least it was in the old edition. So, always good to check your references before you come to class, but uh, anyway. I'll have to dig that up for the more recent edition of the manual. So where, oh, here we go. Found it. Uh, this is on page, so let me, uh, actually let me write this in my notes. So I found the page that's actually 16.1-570. 16.1-570. Okay, so uh, let's move on. I want to talk. I want to talk next about the effective length factor K. Effective length factor K. The effective length factor K allows us to handle. Uh, again, we did this derivation for the pin-pin condition. The thing is, what if we have columns that aren't pin-pin? Uh, effective length factor K. The effective length factor K, this is going to address columns uh, or supports that aren't pin, pin. Uh, handles supports other than pins. Uh, supports other than pins. It will handle supports other than pins. And so, uh, if you look here, there are a variety of support, there is, and this is actually described in uh, table, uh, table in the, well, actually, let me give a different color for this. In the ACI code, this is found in table uh, C-A-7.1, found on page 16.1, dash 570 of the 15th edition of the AISC manual. Okay, so how does this work though? Uh, basically there are theoretical K values and then there are uh, then there are code K values. So uh, first of all you could have your pin pin and that's the one we've already discussed here. This is uh, here. So if I look at, let me look at a few of these. Let me draw them out here maybe. And the whole approach of this is that we're showing a reduced effective length uh, based on how these things are buckling. And you can derive these using sort of just uh, general beam theory, very similar to what we did before. And I'll show you the logic behind this. So this would be a, a fixed and roller. This would be a fixed fixed, etc. I'll just give a couple examples of these. So let's say we have a fixed fixed, a maybe a uh, maybe a pin, maybe a pin uh, fixed, a pin fixed, a fixed fixed, and a pin pin. So this would be pin pin, a pin fixed, and a fixed fixed. and a fixed fixed. Okay, here, uh, if this thing is actually going to buckle, let's look at the actual uh, buckling curves of this. 
Well, this was a perfectly straight column as I, of course, drew it. If this thing is going to buckle, it's going to buckle kind of like this. Just a nice, smooth, idealized buckling curve. However, for a pinned fixed, uh, it's going to buckle fine like that up here. But down here, it's not going to be able to rotate here. So it's going to basically have zero rotation here. So that means there's going to be some sort of inflection point here, some sort of inflection point, IP. And then it's going to do something like this here. And then for a fixed fixed pin, uh, we're going to have fixed. Uh, we're going to have no rotation at both ends. So that means we're going to have more of like an inflection point at the top and the bottom, inflection point, and inflection point. So you're going to get kind of a behavior. You're going to get a, bu a buckling length almost like this. A, a greatly reduced buckling length. And so, basically here. Uh, the reason for this KL is that you're effectively you're you're effectively saying, okay, well, buckling really isn't occurring over the entire length of some of these columns. Uh, here, yes, buckling the KL buckling is occurring over the entire thing. So a KL equal to the entire uh, an effective length, the KL equal to the entire column length is fine. Here, though, however, we would need a reduced column length because it's really not going to undergo buckling over the entire thing. So this is this KL is more like just this. And this KL is just more like, well, just this length. And we have sort of two different values. We have values from theory, and then we'll have the values that the AISC manual wants to use. Uh, so um, in first in red, I'm going to write the theoretical values. If we're, this is uh, the values derived from just uh, mechanics materials and beam theory, et cetera, 0 0.5. These are the theoretical values. But the AISC is going to be a little bit more conservative than that. So uh, they're going to give you certain um, code values that they want you to use instead. Here, 1.0 is fine. Uh, but here, they only want you to use 0 0.8 uh, and 0 0.65. Actually, it's kind of the opposite of conservative. It's that it may be in practice they found these are too conservative when matched with the equations that we already are, the other equations that we're using. So uh, again, this is the theoretical values for these. If, if you ever try to derive these from base principles, these are the values that you'll get in red. But the code values that we're going to use are going to be slightly different. Uh, so uh, and we could even go up to the flagpole condition, which is my, my favorite, which is just a fixed uh, pin, or sorry, a fixed free. And then you actually have to increase the uh, allowable length, or sorry, increase the uh, effective length because you have a free end. But you can read about that there. Uh, this really isn't hopefully too bad. Uh, so again, uh, notes on this. Uh, looking at the change in uh, shape, the delta shape here, just a final note on that. Uh, looking at uh, the shape, the change in shape. If we look at the shape, the change in shape of these things, we can determine uh, we can determine uh, the equivalent Euler column. The equivalent Euler column and uh, or of, uh, so or, or, uh, or of effective length KL. Now, uh, when we actually derive these values, you don't just eyeball it and guesstimate, but you can actually derive these from base principles, just like we did the other one, um, using a few differential equations, that sort of thing, uh, with basically with just different boundary conditions of effective length KL. Of effective length KL. Here. And then, uh, let's see here. And again, so this is kind of the idealized case, uh, but Let's see. Uh, let's look at uh, actual columns. So again, I've mentioned that we have a slight difference between the actual, the sort of the idealized Euler and yielding case and the actual equations here. And these account for a few things. The actual columns, the equations you see in the AISC manual, 
Uh, actual columns, you're never going to have a purely concentric loading. That is fundamentally completely impossible. There, in any kind of real system actually made of atoms, you're never going to have a real, truly 100% uh, concentric loading. That is basically that's basically impossible. Just like you can never have a 100% uh, you know pin pin trust member or something like that. So uh, uh, one of the, the slightly eccentric is going to be accounted for in our fee factor. And this is why we need a fee factor. But uh, we also have some other things accounted for in the, uh, in the actual equations of reduced stress. Uh, slightly eccentric loading is accounted for in phi. In phi and the uh, equations and the allowable stress equations and the stress equations, and, or sorry, and the FCR equation, I should say, the critical stress equations, below yielding and uh, Euler. So we have that. And remember, we assumed initially that uh, columns were straight. Um, but that's, of course, completely impossible. Uh, initially, columns, of course, are not perfectly straight. Are not perfectly straight. And uh, uh, AISC assumes assumes an L over fifteen hundred uh, imperfection. An L over fifteen hundred imperfection. So initially, it's so uh, yes, I've assumed you know we might idealize it as a perfectly vertical column. But uh, AISC assumes an initial L over 1,500 uh, offset, uh, offset here. And that's L over 1,500. And this is one of the uh, sources for the point 0.877. The point 0.8 states, uh, point 0.8 sets, uh, the, if I can manage to talk properly, the point 0.877 comes from here. That takes into account that your load is going to be generating a small bit of moment. Uh, because it will always be slightly eccentric uh, because of the, both the uh, actual initial bend in the column and any initial eccentricity in the loading. So, all right, that'll do it for this portion of the video. Just a brief introduction to, uh, LR, to uh, column design, Euler column buckling, etc. Thank you for watching. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. And as always, thank you.